And lots of times what we're dealing with as we listen to that song and as we think about our life, it's farther along we'll understand why. Why does God let stuff happen? Why do you happen to be where you are? Why is it that in your life you thought it was going to be like this and now it's like this? Why is that the case? And the reason that we're talking about farther along is because you don't know now. That's the implied understanding of this discussion is at the present it doesn't make sense to you. Now, at 46 years old, looking out at people who have been involved in more experiences than I have, who have had things happen in their life that now they have looked back and seen things, there's, there's no way from experience that I'll be able to stand up here and explain to you why what's happening in your life is happened or has happened or how it's all going to work out in the end, et cetera, et cetera. I, I can't do that. But I can, I believe, show you the biblical answer that will help you make sense of it all. And what we find is that the biblical answer is not an answer to a why question. God doesn't tell you oftentimes why he chose to let something happen. He doesn't tell you why he chose to put you in a certain place. The answer ultimately ends up as a who. Who let this happen? Who has control? And do you trust him to know what's best? That's ultimately the answer. Now, each of us, I think, in our lives have have been in places that within just a few years we saw the response and what happened, and it made more sense to us after we look back on it. I remember I was in ninth grade. I was planning to play basketball. I had been going to this particular school for the last four or five years. It was a school there in Tennessee. We were having a a great experience, and a coach came in that was the basketball coach, and uh, there were just some things that went sideways, and ultimately he and I, just a, a ninth grader, and this coach got into a very odd situation in which You know, he basically said, hey, are you going to play basketball for me? And uh, I didn't. And I said, no, sir, I'm going to just play JV the whole time. I don't think I ever want to play for you. And I said it respectfully. He said, fine. No, we're taking the JV team away then. So in an unprecedented event that the school had never seen anything like, he canceled the entire JV team. He said, we're not having a JV team at all. Well, of course. You know, my parents and I thought, wow, what in, what in the world? This is, nobody's ever seen anything like this. Why would he do that? And it was, it was literally I, I just beef with me as a player. That's why it got canceled. And so we went to the president of the school and sat down and said, hey, you know what? I, what's going on? And ultimately, it ended up that I didn't stay at that school. And at the time, I thought, what in the world is happening here? You know, I I just thought, hey, everybody will get in this president's meeting. We'll talk it all out. Everybody will be reasonable, and this will turn out right. You can't just just cancel an entire JV season because uh, one ninth grader who might not have been as respectful as he should have or whatever, but you you don't do that. And so ultimately it ended up with me leaving and going to another school. And looking back after five, six years, my dad was preaching in that community and we started inviting people to the congregation there. And after everything was said and done, about five people had become Christians who then grew up to marry people who were Christians. And there are Christian families in the community now that looking back, one of the catalysts for that was simply that Hey, we got moved out to that area and the Lord's influence and name was magnified through the situation. And all credit goes to God for that. But if you would have said in ninth grade, why is this happening to you? I would have said, I have no idea. It doesn't make any sense to me. There's nothing about it that I can point to and say, oh, I mean, this is happening because... But looking back at it, 
Looking back at it, I wouldn't have changed one thing about it because of the eternal value of what happened. Now, that's a, that's a tiny experience in Kyle Butt's little bitty world of how you can make sense of stuff that doesn't make sense at the time that it's happening. Uh, I want to take you to Luke chapter 22. And I want you to see how Jesus does this with his followers. Uh, maybe you'll remember that Jesus had explained to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, hey, you all are going to deny me. And in chapter 22, when you look at verse 31, you see Jesus say to Peter, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Uh, did that make sense to Peter when Jesus made this statement? Did Peter understand a thing that Jesus was saying to him? In, in fact, I see this interaction and I look at that like Peter is saying, well, <laughs> Jesus, I don't think you understand what's going on. I've already said I'm never going to leave you. I've already explained to you that I'll die with you. Why in the world would you make the statement when I return to you, then take care of my sheep? Why, why would you say that? Because I'm not leaving at all. Uh, did this statement make sense to Peter later in his life? Uh, not far down the road after Peter followed Jesus at a distance and denied him three times to a little servant girl and went out and wept bitterly. Do you think during that time when he was weeping bitterly, it dawned on him, oh, that's what Jesus was talking about. Now, as you look at it, what was Jesus trying to make sure happened when Peter did realize that Jesus knew what he was talking about? He was trying to make sure that, Peter, you're going to be in a situation where you thought you'd never be, and when you remember my words, come back to me. It's not all lost. It's not hopeless. It's not something that can't be remedied. You've just got to come back. Think it made sense to him then? this statement? Do you think at the time the statement was made, Peter understood it at all? No. Peter thought, I'm not going anywhere. What are you talking about? Lord, I'm never leaving you. Have you been in situations where you wondered, you know, why would God let that happen? I can give you an ultimate answer. I want you to turn to John chapter 9. And sometimes we don't really, you can't say we don't like the answer. But you can say, as we think about the answer, we, we wrestle with it. We struggle with it. Look in John chapter 9. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. This guy in the story... You read that he uh, is of age, that the leaders of the Jews believe that he could speak for himself. So he's probably 30 or 40 years old. He's been blind from the day he was born. He's never seen a single thing. This is not that he could see at some time and he lost his vision. And now this is he's been blind his whole entire life. Now, his apostles and lots of the Jews at the time were laboring under the false delusion that if you found somebody that was physically uh, disabled in some way or sometimes financially in a strait or something like that, well, it was because they were sinning. And that goes back to the story of Job that God was trying to show that that wasn't the case. And then ultimately that was to point to Jesus to show that, no, that's not the case at all. But the apostles said to Jesus, they said, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he should be born blind. 
Now, they're struggling with what question? Why? Why is this guy blind? Because, now on this other hand, you know this farther along deal? Uh, we look at it from, hey, why is it that I'm struggling with this question? You know, because this bad thing's happening to me. This, let's flip it just a minute. Why is it that you're in the United States of America, one of the richest countries in the world, you just had a free barbecue meal that most people in the world will not get to eat. You drove here in a car with air conditioning. Many of us can say we had parents who loved us and sacrificed for us. We've had mentors in Christian congregations of people who loved us, who have poured their life into us. Why is it that you are sitting here clothed in stuff that you picked out, eating food that you think is delicious, for our, and living in a house with air conditioning and carpet and hardwood floors and running water, and you can drink out of the tap and it doesn't give you parasites? Why is that? You know, lots of times we struggle with this. Well, why is this bad thing? Well, why is this good thing happening to us? Why am I sitting in the United States of America in a healthy body with parents who love me getting to eat in the speaker's room with Cousin Eddie's Wonder Dip on crackers that is delicious? But all over the world right now, there are people that aren't getting to experience the things that I get to. That they wake up to a mom who is stoned on the couch. And their day is going to consist of them trying to find something processed in their pantry to eat if there's anything. And they're going to be watching the screen all day because there's not a person that cares a thing about them. Well, why do I get to be here and they're there? I don't, I don't know. Can't answer the why question. But that's what they're struggling with here. But they're struggling with it because of this guy who is obviously not as well off as they are. And they're thinking, well, it must be that he's got some sin in his life, or at least his parents have some sin, and somebody needs to be punished for that. And that's why this guy's been born blind. Now, here's Jesus' answer that you wrestle with. Read it with me. Just says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Does that seem fair to you? That this man is born blind, and Jesus says the reason he's born blind is so that today, when I heal this guy, Everybody will know that God is in control. You know, that doesn't quite seem fair to some of us. You know, we think, well, hold on just a second. You're telling me that I'm put here on this planet and God can do whatever he wants for the ultimate purpose of bringing glory to God. That means if he wants to allow me to be born blind so that when I'm 30 or 40 years old, in one show of His power, He presents to the world what He can do and how He can do it. Then that's, then that's okay? Yeah. How's that sit with you? Kind of hard sometimes. You know, you think about Job. You think about how he was... Uh, uh, just if you, if you were to list the people in the world that have ever suffered the most of... That, that anybody's ever suffered. Job. Okay, so the next, the next statement you would make about Job is, okay, who deserves an answer to why they are suffering any more than Job? I mean, of all the people that you would think get an answer, okay? Took my 10 kids, took all my stuff, everybody. 
compared to Job's life, how much do we suffer? Eh, some. Some of us more than others. Put on a scale of 1 to 10. I mean, I'm down at a 2. One and a half, maybe. Some of you are 6. Some of you might be an 8. Job's, you know, he's, he's like when I put my, my wife on a scale of 1 to 10, she's at 1,000. Just Job suffering is at 1,000. You know, if I'm on a scale of 1 to 10. So Job says to God, basically, hey, you know, at least you should tell me why. At least I should get some kind of answer here. You remember God's answer to Job? Let's go. Let's look at it. It's actually a fascinating answer. Job chapter. Let's look right there in verse in chapter 39. Here's what God says to Job. Do you know when the wild mountain goats have babies? Hmm. Great question. Uh, just a uh, show of hands. Anybody know when the wild mountain goats have babies? What day, on what day are the wild mountain goats giving birth to their babies? You don't know. What's the implication? Yeah, but I do. Oh, okay. Uh, you know when the deers have their babies? Deer, catching deers, deers, plural, D-E-R, no S. Can you number the months that they fulfill, or do you know the time when they bear young? They bow down, they bring forth their young, they deliver their offspring, their young ones are healthy, they grow strong with grain, they depart and don't return to them. Who set the wild donkey free? Job, can you even go and catch a wild donkey? Nine. Will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Will he... Bed by your manger, can you bind a wild ox in the furrow with ropes, or will he plow the valleys behind you? Think about it like this. Can you go out to Yellowstone and catch a bison and teach him to pull a plow? No. No, Pete says. It's not happening. Okay, now hold on just a second. I mean, Job's lost 10 kids. And what's God discussing here? A, a wild oxen and when wild goats have babies. Do you think Job is thinking, ah, it's exactly what I was hoping for. You know, I'm glad we're getting down to it. Glad we're having this heart to heart. Um, I was wondering why all this was happening to me and now with all this wild goat discussion, I really feel like starting to, to see well, I think he is starting to see something. Look at 13. The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are her wings and pinions like the kindly storks? She leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may break them. She treats her young harshly as though they were not hers. Here's what God's saying. An ostrich lays eggs on the ground, hardly even comes back to them, and yet ostriches... Survive great. How is it that there's a, a, a bird the size of a small motorbike that lays eggs the size of a personal watermelon and anything could crush them, but somehow ostriches are doing great? Who has designed it so that an ostrich lives through that? Okay, but not a, God doesn't quit. He's, he just keeps going. 19. Have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a locust? His majestic snorting strikes terror. He paws the valley. 26. Does the hawk fly by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? Does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high? Uh, when, when you get in a discussion with somebody who is struggling with life and they want to know why God's letting something happen to them, is this the course you take? Start talking about nature. 
This is the course God took. God Almighty, the creator of the world, said, listen, Job, let me just ask you a question. Can you even explain to me how an eagle flies? You don't even know the aerodynamics of it. You can't even explain it to me. God doesn't then even finish the sentence for him. You understand what I'm saying there? God doesn't then say, therefore that means he demands that Job comes to the conclusion. And what's the conclusion that God is forcing Job to come to? God, you know what you're doing. And I don't understand it. But I know who is in control. If you can make an eagle fly, if you could tame the wild donkey, and then he gets to the Leviathan and the behemoth, the chief of the ways of God, and starts explaining about a creature that is so ferocious and monstrous that nobody can even bring a sword or a spear or an arrow to him, and God's in complete control of all that, and finally, after a discussion that goes on about the natural world, that's all you read about, basically. Animals, one animal after another animal after another animal after another. Here's what Job finally says. Job 42, 1 and 2. Then Job answered the Lord and said, no, check this out. I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you you ask who is this who hides counsel without knowledge therefore I've uttered what I did not understand things too wonderful for me which I did not know listen please and let me speak you said I will question you and you shall answer me I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Hmm. Interesting discussion God has with Job. Job comes away from it having absolutely no question, no, no answer to his question, why? Not one. What is the answer to his question? Who? Gets done with this discussion? And what does he say? Oh, I've heard about God, but now I really know who he is. So, I think that this idea of farther along means that you have to have an understanding ultimately of, of who God is. Because I think God is telling you, I'm not telling you why. Now, I think that's for any number of reasons. Number one, if I did tell you why, you might not think that the price is worth it. But I know it is. Number two, if I did tell you why, you might not even understand it the way I explain it. And number three, if I did tell you why, you would miss the entire point of what's happening. So I'd like to give you some help. But it's the help that I've got. It's, it's not, okay, hey, here are six words that all start with C that you're going to use to get through this struggle. I'm not saying I know anybody who does that kind of thing because some people don't start all their words with the same letter. Although if you did see, you could have actually spelled the word peace with the letters that Tyler did use. But uh, P-I-E-C-E, -E, that's how I mentally put it together in my mind. That's how I thought I could remember it if I just made a word out of it. So, got no building blocks or things like that, although they're great to have. 
But here's what I've got. Here's what I've got as I, as I think about this. If you know that God does everything he wants to do, he's got the power to do it, you don't even understand it. The second thing you've got to know is what's he want to do with you. That's the second thing. Okay, if, if he's got all the power and he can do it all, what's he trying to do with you? Okay, you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And I think you know this. I want you to read it yourself. And this, I think, will help us get to the farther along idea. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Okay? Uh, you know that you've got a God that's big enough to do everything that there is that can be done. That if God were to show up and you were to say, well, why did you let this happen to me? God would say, you know, in essence, you're asking the wrong question. Who am I? Oh, and just by the way, let me explain to you subatomic particles. Let me tell you how many hairs you got on your head. Let me tell you that I can make a world where all of these things work perfectly and you can't even feed half the town breakfast every morning. And, and I feed every animal every single day of every single week. Okay, so you come to who God is and then God says, here's what I'm promising you. This is what you know for a fact. All things work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, let me tell you what happened to me the other day. I watched a movie, La La Land. Uh, I, I always have to preface it and say I, I have a little uh, thing, the vid angel and clear play that cut out language and stuff. So if you've seen that movie and it had language and stuff in it, I watched it, I didn't see that. It'll take out any of the stuff. So I don't, I don't know if, uh, I preface that to say, sometimes I have, I've said, well, I watched a movie the other day. And somebody came to me and said, you watched that movie the other day? And I said, yeah, man, what, what's wrong with it? They said, man, there's three terrible scenes in profanity all through it. I said, well, I didn't see anything because my little thing cut the stuff out. So if you've seen La La Land and it had stuff in it, I don't know, I didn't see that. But here was the thing. I watched it and I got about halfway through and it looked like it was shaping up to have the perfect ending. Well, this guy and this girl ultimately were going to get together at the end. Everything looked like it was going to come together perfectly. My son had seen it before, and so he's like, Dad, you're going to love this movie. He fell asleep. I was still watching it. We get to the end, and it looks like it's just all going to come together exactly right. And then it doesn't. Did you say, have you seen it? Yeah. It's like it's set up for this girl to actually just be acting in a movie where she married this other guy. And, but at the end, they don't get together. I won't read up and I said, why did you let me watch that movie? That was the worst movie I've ever seen. It ended up terribly. There's, there's no reason why a person should be able to direct a movie where at the end of it you want to punch somebody because it doesn't end up right. I was so mad. Do you know there are going to be a lot of people where the ending's not right? They had the opportunity for it to be right, but they didn't love God. They hadn't given themselves to God. They weren't the called according to His purpose. You know, you're called by the gospel. You then obey that gospel and you are added to the family of God and God makes a promise to those who obey the gospel and are added to His family that it doesn't matter what you go through, I'm going to work every single thing in your life out perfectly. But if you're not in that group, guess what? The movie doesn't end right. So this only works. The farther along idea... 
We'll know all about it farther along. We'll understand why. It only works if you are a faithful follower of God. Now, let me explain to you a nuance of that. Uh, Those people who aren't faithful followers of God, it's not going to work out for their good, but they're going to understand it. It's going to dawn on them what they missed out on. They're going to realize that God had told them something that they didn't pay attention to, and it cost them eternity. You know, I think about, as I process that idea, that some people have, and I think probably in each of our lives, have have been privileged to see that before ultimately it ends up in destruction. I mean, do you think Eve understood what it meant when God said, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil or even touch it, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay, that word die. You can explain something to somebody. But do you think she understood what die meant? I mean, Adam had been basically formed out of the dirt. God breathed life into him, took his rib, created Eve. She gave birth to two sons, Cain and Abel. Hadn't seen a human death in all of her life. Probably had no concept what human death meant. Do you think on the day that she realized she would never see Abel again, She understood what God was trying to tell her before that first human death. Oh, she understood it. You know, but for those who don't understand that God is trying to help the world be arranged in a way that all should come to repentance and that God has no joy, no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and that God desires that all people should be saved. But there are going to be some people who just simply say, I don't care. And for the people who say, I don't care what God wants, God's not making them a promise. But for the people who say, God, I trust you, God is making them a promise. And the promise is not that you're going to understand what I'm doing. Not that you're going to know why I let this happen in your life or that happen in your life. God's promise is it will turn out all right. In fact, not only all right, it's going to turn out awesome. And how in the world it's going to turn out awesome, you can't even see it now. But one day, when you look back on everything that happened in your life, you will be able to know that I was working it all for your good. But the point is, you can't see that now. That's why you're still asking why. It's not something that you're like, oh, okay, so how does it, so so why are you letting this happen? No, no, you're misunderstanding the, the, the system. The reason that that's the answer is you can't see it now. Let me take you to the uh, discussion of this in Hebrews. Uh, go to Hebrews chapter 11. It's the entire idea of faith. And the idea of faith is, uh, in in one sense, I have no idea why God's asking me to do this, but I know who's asking me, and I know it's got to turn out right, and so I do it. And if you look right there in chapter 11, verse 13. Let's read those verses. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off were assured of them 
embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. This only works if you recognize that this is not your home. If you think that this is where the ending is going to come out right, then you're going to have a problem. But if you realize that this physical world is not the end of the discussion and that there is a future home waiting on you where you get to be with the creator who understands everything and made you a promise that all things will work together for good in your life. Not that they are good, but they'll work together for good. Then that next sentence about Abraham makes a lot more sense. So God comes to Abraham. And says, take your son, your only son Isaac, and go offer him as a sacrifice to me. And and listen to Abraham's reasoning as he did exactly what God asked him to do. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. So try to look through the, the... the mindset of Abraham. Abraham, I'm going to bless every single nation in the world through you. He thinks, okay, it's going to be through Ishmael. God says, no, it's not through Ishmael. It's going to be through Isaac. Then God says, now go kill Isaac. Who's asking? God. What has God promised that he'll do? Bless every single nation in the world through Isaac. And he just asked Abraham to offer Isaac. Remember, you've got the who and the promise. You've got God and the promise is that every nation in the world is going to be blessed through Isaac. Now read how Abraham processes this information. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Here's what Abraham knew. I have no idea why God's asking me to do this. God, who is making a a command to me to sacrifice Isaac, I don't know why, but I know he made me a promise, and that promise is that all the nations in the world are going to be blessed through Isaac. So here was Abraham's thinking, so if I kill Isaac, God will raise him up, because God promised me that he'll bless everybody through Isaac. How's that going to happen, Abraham? Abraham? You ever seen anybody raised from the dead like that? No, but God promised. You mean to tell me that because of the being God who made you a promise that you are willing to understand that everything in your life, even something as hard as you sacrificing your own son, God will turn it into exactly what he promised he would say? Exactly what he promised he would do. Yeah. How can you do that? Faith. So let me ask you this question. Let's bring it to a close. Are there some things in your life right now that you do not understand why you're going through? Maybe they're not your life. Maybe it's people close to you. Maybe it's people in your family. Maybe it's people in other countries. Maybe you work with a group of people where you see children who are beaten on a regular basis. Do you believe that God is in control of this world? Do you believe that God has the power to fulfill His promises? I'm going to finish it with one verse. 
It's right there in Hebrews chapter 12. And I want you to look at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, I, I think about that with this illustration. I think about it all the time, every time I read that verse. If you put your hand in front of your face and you focus your eyes on your hand, you don't see what's behind it. But you can put your hand in front of your face and focus on what's behind it. And you can see past your hand to what's back there. The picture here is of a cross in Jesus' way. But he's not seeing the cross. Who for the joy that was set before him looked past the cross and saw what was waiting for him on the other side of the suffering. Now how could he know that? Because he had a father that he trusted who he knew was powerful enough to do what he had said he was going to do, and he made him a promise. We've got that God. Do you know who's in control? And do you believe that when he says he'll work everything out for your good if you love him, he will really do that? I think you do. Maybe you never get an answer to your question, why? But you certainly have an answer, I think, to the question, who? And I think that's the real answer to struggling through this discussion. Appreciate it.